Well, good morning, everybody. I want to say good morning to those watching online, and I and, uh, want you to know that we love you, and we miss you, and we're glad that you're able to join us through the internet. We're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 6. If you'll turn there, and I know what you're thinking, Jeremiah, what about Romans, right? So we were slated to finish um, a, a, a four-year journey through Romans today. That's what's on the sermon map. Uh, however, my allegiance is not to the sermon map. And uh, over the last week, God has given me a new direction for the sermon today, and He's affirmed it and confirmed it through several of our elders. And, uh, and so I'm just going to be obedient and preach from Jeremiah 6 today. Now, if you're going to do the new member class next week, That'll be at this, this time slot, so you'll need to come to the early service at 845, and then uh, new member class at 1015. And if you would, sign up for that in the lobby. That'll help us kind of know what to prepare for. Now, uh, when Jeremiah was a teenager, more than likely, uh, probably about Isaac Messmaker's age, or, or maybe, uh, maybe Sam Ilianko's age, somewhere around there, uh, the Lord came to Jeremiah and, and said these words, said, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. And I thought about this even as I was preparing for this morning. You know what God might do today? God might call a young man in this room to preach his word. God might do that today. God's still doing that. And, and, and so here's what I want you to know about Jeremiah's call, though. Jeremiah's call to preach the word of the Lord came at a dark time in Judah's history. And I will say this. If the Lord calls you today, young man, to preach the word of God, these are tough times in which he would be calling you. Judah was backslidden. And here's what makes that unusual not only was Judah backslidden Judah was very religious you say pastor how can that be write this down you can be very religious and very far from God all at the same time that's exactly what we see in Judah's history at the time of Jeremiah let me show you this in 620 this is this is after our text, but I want you to see it, 620. For what purpose does frankincense come to me from Sheba and the sweet cane from a distant land? God is asking this question. And then he says this, your burnt offerings are not acceptable. Your sacrifices are not pleasing to me. The problem in Judah was not that they weren't bringing their offerings and their sacrifices. The problem in Judah was that God was not accepting them. Jeremiah was preaching during the last 50 years of Judah's freedom. Uh, Jeremiah was a witness to the Babylonian takeover and the destruction of the temple. He wrote about it in the book of Lamentations. He's known as the weeping prophet. So in the days that are leading up to God pouring out judgment on Judah, Jeremiah preaches a series of sermons. And what we're doing today is we're jumping into the end of the second sermon in Jeremiah's sermon series. So I want you to pick up in 6.13. We're going to read down to 19. It says in verse 13, For from the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for gain. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, Peace, peace. But there is no peace. Were they ashamed because of the abomination they have done? They were not even ashamed at all. They did not even know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. 
at the time that I punish them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. Now look at verse 16. Thus says the Lord, Stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is. Walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk in it. And I set watchmen over you saying, Listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not listen. Therefore hear, O nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I am bringing disaster on this people, the fruit of their plans, because they have not listened to my words. And as for my law, they have rejected it also. A lot of you had commitments and some of you had other priorities, but yesterday we met on the square. For an hour we prayed. Pastor Dennis St. Lawrence uh, led us in our opening uh, prayer and, and he said these words. He said, America is in trouble. These are the words that I've said to you Recently, And I want to tell you why America is in trouble. America is in trouble because the people who live in America have rejected the Word of God. And worse yet, men and women who claim to be Christians have rejected the Word of God. And many act as though... God has no authority to speak about holiness and righteousness and right and wrong. I I came up with this illustration. I I hope it will resonate with you. But suppose you were invited to a conference. It's a conference designed to help people understand and, and, and have compassion for those who can't walk. Those who are paralyzed. And let's just say you've kind of had a heart for people that have physical handicaps. And so you go to the conference. And when you get there, you find out the keynote speaker at the conference is none other than your pastor, Dr. Paul Miller. And you're excited. Wow! Going to get here, Pastor Paul. And so for 45 minutes, I walk back and forth on the stage in front of you, trying to help you understand the plight of those who can't walk. Now, for at least a few of you, you would begin to wonder what authority do I really have? To help you understand the plight of those who can't walk. Because I'm not paralyzed. As a matter of fact, everybody in my family can walk. And truth be told, you would have much more respect for that conference and that keynote speaker if Mrs. Aaron LaFollette was the keynote speaker. If you don't know Miss Erin, she sits usually back here in a wheelchair. Why? Because she's paralyzed. She can't walk. And she's given me permission to to share that illustration. But listen, here's where I'm going with that. Guys, have we forgotten what this is? This is not the word of sinful man who has no authority on holiness. Guys, this is the word of holy God. Righteousness is the foundation of his throne. Remember Isaiah 6? Isaiah said in the, in the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord and the train of his robe filled the temple. And there were seraphim. There were these angels with six wings. With two they flew. Two, they covered their eyes. Two, they covered their feet. And they cried out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. 
in the Hebrew, that's the way you express the superlative. He's the holiest. Guys, this is not the words of Charles. Not Charles Wesley, not Charles Finney, not Charles Spurgeon. These aren't the words of Billy or his son Franklin. These are the words of God. God has spoken. And I want you to write this down. Our God is infinitely holy. Infinitely holy. He has authority to speak on what's right and wrong, what's holy and what's sinful. Now, I want to go to chapter 5 to give you a summary of the context, the situation in Judah. Look at verse 3, chapter 5. O Lord, do not your eyes look for truth. You have smitten them, but they did not weaken You have consumed them, but they refused to take correction. Look at this. They have made their faces harder than rock. They have refused to repent. Man, as I thought about people making their faces harder than rock, I thought about America. And I don't even really know where to begin because we have made our faces like granite carved in the black hills of South Dakota. And I think about how many people today have made their faces harder than rock and said, it's a woman's body and it's her right to choose. While they're affirming the ripping of babies limb by limb from his or her mother's womb. And we make our faces harder than rock. And we say, love is love. And we affirm homosexual marriage and all kinds of aberrant, ungodly, unbiblical definitions of marriage. And we make our faces harder than rock. And we elevate our political party allegiance over the word of God. And we make our faces harder than rock. And we say, Sunday is my only day off. I can worship wherever I am. And I submit to you like Judah, we are living in a land of widespread unrepentance. Widespread unrepentance. We're living in a day when God's people, by and large, have refused to repent. This word repent in the Hebrew means to turn back. Now, I don't know, I don't ever know in a room who's saved and who's lost. I'm talking about who's born again or regenerated and who is unregenerate. I don't don't ever know a man's heart. I just know what's going on in my heart. And in the sixth grade in Douglasville, Georgia, I was born again. I was regenerated. God gave me a new heart. And if you've not been given a new heart, unless you repent, you will perish. Jesus said, Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. You will go to hell. And you will spend forever in a lake of fire. But you know, there's another call today for God's people to repent. The reason Christians experience the chastening of God is our refusal to repent. Listen to Revelation 3.19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, therefore be zealous and repent. This is to the church. Jeremiah 5, 7. Look at 5, 7. Why should I pardon you? Your sons have forsaken me and sworn by those who are not gods. When I had fed them to the full, they committed adultery and trooped 
to the harlot's house. They were well-fed, lusty horses, each one neighing after his neighbor's wife. Man, guys, God gave Israel splendid cities they did not build. God gave his people houses full of good things that they did not fill. God gave them cisterns that they did not dig. God gave them uh, olive trees and vineyards that they did not plant. And the Bible says they ate and they were satisfied. And what did they do? To show gratefulness, they trooped to the harlot's house. We see somebody left a poster on the gazebo on the square and it said, God bless America. You know what I want to say? He did. He did bless America. Now, Jeremiah is speaking of literal adultery and also metaphorically they played the harlot and they turned to other gods. They were ungrateful. Write this down. We're living in a, a land of ungratefulness. Widespread ungratefulness. The average American household spends $2,600 a year on TV and internet. Whether it's cable or what is it? Hulu or who knew? I don't know. All these things. $2,600 a year. I looked up to see what is the average household give to the church and it's less than that. I, we're spoiled rotten. I was in a store in our community last week and I asked the salesman, I said, hey, can you get me a price? I told him what I needed. And then I said, but wait a minute. I need the single income poor preacher with two in college price. And without batting an eye, this man that I've prayed for, to my knowledge, he's unchurched, he looked at me and he said, let me tell you something, son, if you got two kids in college, you're rich, you're not poor. And I thought, my word, I've been rebuked by the guy I've been praying for. But he was right. He's so right. Can you imagine a guy who has two kids in American colleges? I guarantee you I'm among the 1% most wealthy in the world. And what am I doing? I'm poor mouthing. Good grief. And I, I tell you, this sermon has stomped my little toes. And I've had to confess, and the past, some of the pastors who prayed with us yesterday at the square, we met out at Red Hall last week, and we prayed. And I had to confess, and I had to repent of things like pride, thinking that somehow I can make the wind blow in this community, like somehow I can bring an increase. God brings the increase. Rob said it. Paul said it. God said it. What's America doing with all this wealth? Well, by and large, we're trying to build bigger, buy bigger, buy newer, buy faster. We're not satisfied. We're like lusty horses. Pastor Dennis, yesterday, he was talking about all these statistics about the porn industry. And I just thought this. God help us that there's even a term, porn industry. Look at verse 28 of chapter 5. It says, they are fat, they are sleek. They also excel in deeds of wickedness. They do not plead the cause, the cause of the orphan that they may prosper. And they do not defend the rights of the poor. Guys, like Judah... We're in a place of widespread ungodliness. And at this point, forget the orphan and the poor. We need to remember the unborn. The unborn's not even safe in America. God help us that there's even a term, abortion industry. God help us. 
Look at 6.13 in our text. From the least of them, even to the greatest of them, everyone is greedy for gain. Everyone deals falsely. You know what we've done in America? We have sacrificed integrity and morality and truth on the altar of the American dream. You know what's motivating Planned Parenthood? It's not that they love killing babies. I don't think it's that. I think it's that they love money. I looked at their annual report on their website. In their last annual report, Planned Parenthood had net assets of $1.9 billion. That's a B. Billion dollars. And their revenue, their net revenue, was $1.7 billion. And I'm going to say to you, Cornerstone Community Church, your vote on November the 3rd has a direct impact on the lives of unborn babies. And I'm begging you, and I'm pleading with you to vote And if we get James 1.27 right, protecting the most vulnerable is the purest expression of worship. James 1.27. Look at chapter 6, verse 13. From the prophet to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there's no peace. See, America, like Judah, is suffering from widespread shepherd unfaithfulness. Shepherd unfaithfulness. And I'm talking about pulpits all across our land being unfaithful to the Word of God. The church will never be on track when those who preach in the church are off track. In Jeremiah 5, verse 30, it says... An appalling and horrible thing has happened in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely. And the priests rule on their own authority. And my people love it so. But what will you do at the end of it? You know why the people love it so? It's because there's no call to repent. No call to repent. And preachers across this land are afraid to preach repentance. We are living in the perilous days of 2 Timothy 4 when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they want their ears tickled. Look at verse 14. They have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, Peace, peace. But there's no peace. Why? Write this down. There's no peace apart from repentance. And right now, as I stand and I preach this morning, there are pastors in this country standing before people like I'm standing before you. And rather than preaching the blood of Jesus and the gospel of grace as the only all-sufficient remedy for the chaos across this nation. Here's what they're doing. They're standing and they're telling their congregations the gospel is not enough. And they're telling their congregations that we need the gospel and a social justice movement. And they're saying that as, until we change franchise names, until we remove all these monuments, until we pay reparations, the chaos will never end. And I'm saying you can do all that and the chaos will still not end unless we repent. We must repent. And here's why the gospel's not enough in their churches. The gospel's not enough in their churches because you only receive the gospel through faith and repentance. And until white men and black men and brown men and women repent of ethnic hatred, repenting because the love of God has been poured into their hearts, there's never going to be peace in America. 
And I don't care how many statues you take down. I don't care how many team names you change. I don't care who controls the House or the Senate. You're not going to have peace. And God says these unfaithful preachers are an abomination. They stand up there preaching this junk and they don't even know how to blush. And write this down. The abomination plaguing our land is pastors preaching peace apart from repentance. And they stand up there and they say, God wants you to be happy. And they ought to blush with shame. God did not crush his son to make me happy. He did that to make me holy. To make me as holy as Jesus so that I could have a relationship with God. Not only is the social gospel an abomination, but so is the prosperity gospel. And rather than stand and and proclaim that sex is reserved for a man and a woman united in covenant marriage, pastors coddle those who claim to be Christians, afraid if they speak up they'll offend them. Well, what about offending God? And rather than preaching God hates divorce, preachers say, well, you know, God wants you to be happy. It'd be okay. And rather than opening the word of God and showing that Moses permitted divorce because people made their faces like granite and their hearts were hard. And we're not protecting a high view of marriage and preachers are just blowing in the wind like a reed. Letting the culture define marriage in the church. Rather than confronting in love those who gossip and slander and backbite, we, we, just, we just say, ah, oh, well, I'll just ignore it. I hope they'll stop. You know when they'll stop? They'll stop when you take the word of God in love and you ask them to repent. And by the way, that's an every member responsibility. Now, what are we going to turn back to? Repent means turn back. Look at verse 16. Jeremiah 6, 16. Thus says the Lord, stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. Now, Canaan and Aiden, I know you're going to find this hard to believe, but listen, this is true. When I was your age... There were no cell phones. None. Listen, I was Mac Rich's age driving around like him in my jacked up Chevy. He's got a Ford, but we'll pray for him. Driving around in my jacked up Chevy. Mac, I'm driving around with no cell phone. Can you believe that's risky? (laughs) And then they came out with cell phones. They were so big, you had to carry them in a bag like a pocketbook. Remember that? Tim, you had one, didn't you? You and Robin both. And, and I'm walking around with a bag phone. Look, how many remembers dial-up internet? Man, you talk about making you want to say bad words. Good night. <laughs> bong, bong. Like, good night. What is that? When it comes to technology... Ancient is bad. But listen to me. When it comes to truth, ancient is the only way. The only way. There's no new way to define the beginning of life. Life begins in the womb, at conception. There's no new way to define sexuality. God made us boys and girls. There's no new way to define boundaries for sex there's no new forms of marriage there's one way it's an ancient way God has spoken now let me give you three steps to repentance and I'll be done number one stop and look stop and look look at verse 16 
stand by the ways and see. Look, ways is plural, isn't it? Because look, there's so many winds of doctrine blowing right now. There's so many voices in our culture right now. And I'm going to tell you, parents, grandparents, you better be talking to your kids and your grandkids or they're going to be swept away by a movement rooted in paganism and Marxism. And I'm talking to you about the church of Black Lives Matter. Now, some of my very best friends in the world are black men. I think about Pastor Ralph Cherry in Macon, Georgia. A mentor to me, a dear, 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 dear friend. He's black. His skin is black. I, that, that's, I'm not making a statement about that. I'm telling you, the church of Black Lives Matter is pagan. And it's Marxist. And it's not being built on a ungodly, unbiblical platform and you better do some homework. And, and you, you call me, you email me this week and I will help you with your homework. We better stop and we better look and number two, we better ask and we better test. Ask for the ancient path. Man, what if we were as zealous for what God has said when He has spoken, as we were to see what was trending on Facebook or on social media. Man, I told the first service, I'm longing for the day when we are hungry in America for truth. When we are hungry in America for God. Man, I'm looking for the day when you guys are banging on my front door. Pastor, when are we going to start the services in Melcher? Pastor, when are we going to plant a new church? Pastor, when are we going to start a Saturday night service? And bang on my door. That's what I want. Hungry to ask and know God and His Word. And then verse 16, walk in it. Turn and walk. Turn and walk. And some of you this morning, that's, the, that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to repent. And to turn from your unbiblical deeds and walk in holiness and righteousness and the ways of God. God has spoken. Acts 26, 20. It says they were declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem. And then throughout all the region of Judea. Even to the Gentiles, listen, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds appropriate to repentance. You know, we talked, we've been reading a book now for months in staff meeting uh, by Ronnie Floyd called, uh, uh, it just left me, it's, it's uh, Prayer. <laughs> That's not the title, but that's the subject. <laughs> you can see what an impact it's made on me. The subtitle is Developing... Oh, it's called How to Pray. Developing an Intimate Prayer Life with, with Jesus. So anyway, in that book... Now see, I'm blushing. That's a good sign. And so in that book, uh, we were just talking about, you know... Possibly just making this Sunday a prayer meeting. And here's what God put on my heart. Yes, we do need to pray. But before we pray, we need to repent. We need to turn back. And we need to turn to the deeds appropriate to repentance. James said this, James 4, 17. Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it's sin. That's James 4, 17. Now look, a praise team's coming up. And they're going to sing a song of worship. And I want us as a church to worship as they sing. But hear me, let's don't be Judah. But God said, I will not accept your worship. Why? Because they didn't repent. And I don't know for you what it might be that you need to repent of. For me this week, it has been pride... 
It has been fear. It has been anxiety and worry. It has been a spirit of ungratefulness and apathy. All these things I've had to repent of in the last week before I could stand and preach to you. And guys, we do need to humble ourselves and pray, but the verse says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways and pray, I will hear from heaven and heal their land. And so would you, would you repent this morning? Would you ask? Look, God already knows your heart. That's a line in this song we're about to sing. He already knows your heart. And get this. And he loves you anyway. And he's like that daddy on the front porch looking for the prodigal to come home. Come home today. His arms are wide open. 